Let's bow our heads and pray as we go into our presentation for tonight. Father in heaven, how we thank you for the word of the living God. As we open the Bible tonight, may your spirit speak to our hearts. Where we are discouraged, encourage us. Where we need strength, strengthen us. Where we're worried, give us peace. And tonight, where we are lacking commitment, impress us by the Holy Spirit to bring deep commitment to our soul. May there be eternal decisions made in this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you noticed that society is rapidly changing today? Values that African families used to teach their children are some way today being compromised. Through the materialism of many of our cities, Africa is growing in its economy. Things are changing. The arrival of the internet has brought crime and violence and immorality into our homes. As you look around you today, many Africans are asking, how can we bring up our families in a godly way? How can we avoid our children getting involved in things like immorality, things like stealing and theft, things like alcohol? And how can we, in our own lives, as adults, live the godly life that he wants us to live? Is there a moral guideline in life? Does God have a foundation in his government? What is God's message for these last days of earth's history? That message that we began to study last evening is found in the book of Revelation. It's pictured as three angels flying in the middle of heaven. We began to study that message last evening. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven. The angel flies with an urgent message to go to the ends of the earth, having the everlasting gospel, the good news of God's grace and goodness and love and forgiveness and power, to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Here's a message that leaps across geographical boundaries. Here's a message that goes to every language. Here's a message for our day as important as Noah's message was for his day. The first angel says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Fear God. What does that mean, fear God? We studied it last time. Fearing God means give, obeying God. To fear is to reverence. To fear is to respect. We reverence or respect God by obeying God. Now it says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Living in the judgment hour, living just before the coming of Jesus, living when the destinies of all human beings are to be settled. We are accountable for our actions, and God calls us to live godly lives through his grace of obedience. Now, the society we live in is a society that says you're not responsible for your actions. It's a society that says, well, you do certain things because, well, that's your genetics. You do certain things because of your environment. In the judgment hour of this earth's history, when we stand before the judge of all the universe, we cannot say, my friends made me do it. We cannot say, I did this because I was pressured to do it by others. We cannot say, I did this because of my father, my mother, my sister, my brother. We can't say, I did this because oh, of my environment. Every single one of us will stand before God alone. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, every single one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. The judgment calls us not to blame others for our alcoholism, not to blame others for the drug addiction, not to blame others because we have entered into a life of robbery, not to blame others because of infidelity. The judgment calls us 
to be faithful and obedient to God because one day we will stand before God. Now, God's law is the basis of all morality. It's the standard of all judgment. God does not judge us based on what we think is right. God judges us based on what he says is right. It's not what we believe we ought to do. I've talked to young people who've lived together before they were married. And they've said to me, oh, pastor, we don't think it's wrong. I've talked to people who sometimes may take something because they're poor from a store, and they don't think it's wrong. And I've had to say to them, it's not what you think that counts. It's what God thinks that counts. What do you say, church? So in the judgment, God's not going to say to us, well, did you think that was wrong or not? God's law is the basis of all morality. God's law is the standard of all judgment. Now notice what the Bible says in James 2 verse 12. So speak and so do as you will be judged by the law of liberty. So God's law is not something restrictive. God's law is not something that takes away our freedom. What does the Bible call God's law? Help me tonight. What does the Bible call God's law? The law of what, everybody? You're not sure. The law of what, everybody? The law of liberty. So God's law frees us to live the most abundant, the happiest, the most enjo enjoyable life possible. It is the life of disobedience. It is the life of rebellion against God that brings sickness, sorrow, suffering, and death. If you want to live a life of abundance, a life of joy, Jesus said, John 13, verse 17, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I have the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus desires for you to have peace in your heart. Jesus desires that you have joy in your soul. Jesus desires that you live an abundant life. And how can that be true? As we choose to follow Christ, there may be difficulties and there will be. There may be trials and there will be. There may be challenges and there will be. But the peace that Christ gives us, the joy that Christ gives us, the happiness that Christ gives us is far greater than any trial that we will ever face. What do you say? Amen. Now, God's law is the pathway to freedom. God's law is the pathway to true happiness. Now, there are those people that say, oh, I follow Jesus, but I don't have to worry about God's law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So how does God define sin? In the King James Version of the Bible, it said sin is the transgression of the law. Transgression means breaking. So sin is not what I think in my mind, but sin is breaking God's law. Sin is a violation of the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. Did God write the Ten Commandments on, on paper? Is that where he wrote them? You're silent. Is that where God wrote the Ten Commandments on paper? Did he write them on sand by the ocean to be washed away? Why did God write the Ten Commandments on stone? Why did, why did he do that? Because stone is a memorial that will not be disintegrated over time. To indicate that his Ten Commandment law was eternal, he wrote them with stone. Now, God wrote them with his own finger. How many things in the Bible are written in stone by God's own finger? How many? The Ten Commandment law. So if God wrote the Ten Commandment Law himself 
with his own finger, don't you think that that Ten Commandment law is pretty important? Do you think that anybody could have the authority to change God's law? Can any human being change something that was written with God's own finger on tables of stone? Could they do that? Certainly not. The Bible says that God's law is his eternal moral standard by which he defines sin and establishes our accountability with God. And Jesus put it this way in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. If you love me. So all of our obedience comes not from some legalistic requirement, but we know that God wants the best for us. We know that God wants us to have lives filled with joy and happiness. And we know that God's way is the best. So when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, our service to Christ is based on our love for Christ. When we see what Jesus has done for us, he came to this world. He lived in tabernacled in human flesh. He faced Satan head on. He met the temptations of Satan. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. He provides for us eternal life. And because of what he has done for us, and because of his love for us, our response to that love is to keep his commandments. Love always leads to obedience. Love never leads to disobedience. Now, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, we read, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Can I say that I know Christ, but I don't have to obey him? Now, by this we know that we know him. How, what's the evidence that we know Christ? Because love leads us to obedience. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a, is a what? Is a what? Is a what? Liar, and the truth is not in him. So if I say, I know God, and if I say, I love God, but don't worry about those commandments. No, don't, don't, don't worry about that commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't worry about that commandment that says, thou shalt not steal. Oh, that one on the Sabbath, oh, that one, that's an old, that's old. Don't, don't worry about it. He that says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a, is a what? A Who calls him a liar? God does. I don't want to be called a liar by God, do you? God leads us through his grace, by his power, to live obedient lives. And when we face the judgment, saved by grace, we will be led before God to be obedient to his law. No, I obey God, not in order to be saved, because my good works will never save me. You remember what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10? By grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God and not of yourselves. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's verse 9. But don't miss verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to good works. Now notice those three passages. First, how we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works. But verse 10 says, if we are saved by grace through faith, we will be created for good works. So works are the evidence of our faith. I obey God not to earn my salvation. My salvation comes by grace. But because Christ has saved me, his power works within me to change me and to create within me good works. Now, grace and law are not ideas that are contradictory. I've heard some Christians say this, law is the Old Testament concept, grace is the New Testament concept. Wait a minute. When we're up in heaven and I ask Noah, how were you saved? Will Noah say, oh, I was saved by the law, but you are saved by grace. Uh, when I ask Daniel, how were you saved? Will he say, oh, I was saved by the law? When I ask Jeremiah, well, not at all. They're not two methods of salvation. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 
verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Who has the grace of God appeared to, everybody? Who has it appeared to? All men. Did it appear to Noah? Yeah, the Bible says Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it, it's not two methods of salvation. Everybody who's saved is saved by grace. But those saved by grace are led to be obedient to God's law. Now, what is the role of God's law? The Bible tells us. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. By the law is the knowledge of sin. So what is the function of the law of God? It's to reveal to us what sin is. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, follow me closely. I'll give you an equation. If, there, if by the law is the knowledge of sin, and if sin is transgression of the law, if there is no law, there is no what? Sin. If there is no sin, there is no what? Grace. Because if there is no law, there is no sin, because sin is the transgression of the law. And if there is no sin, there is no need for grace. And if there is no grace, we don't need the cross. Because Jesus came, because we broke the law, Jesus came because we needed grace, and so Jesus died on the cross. So if there's no grace, there's no cross. If there's no cross, there is no salvation. If there is no salvation, there is no Savior. So you see, if you do away with the law, you do away with sin. If you do away with sin, you do away with the need for grace. If you don't need grace, why is there the cross? And if you don't need the cross, why is there salvation? And if you don't need salvation, why is there a Savior? You see what happens with this strange idea that the law is done away with? It destroys the entire plan of salvation. So what's the role of the law? The law is to reveal sin. What's the role of grace? The Bible says, I quoted it, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace, what is grace? Grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's pardon. Grace is God's forgiveness. Grace is God's power. Grace is God's love. Do you need mercy tonight? Have you broken the law of God? There is mercy for you. Do you need pardon tonight? Have you lived lives and done things you wish you'd never done, there's pardon for you tonight. Do you need forgiveness tonight? Wherever you are tonight, have you come to this meeting feeling condemned and guilty? You can leave this meeting with the burden of guilt off your shoulder because there's grace for you tonight. Have you come to this meeting lacking power, failing on the same thing again and again? In God's grace, there's power for you. Have you come to this meeting longing for love? In God's grace, there's love for you. Now, does God's grace do away with God's law? Certainly not. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Do we then make Lloyd the void the law through faith? You see what Paul is asking. Do we do away with the law? Does our faith make the law of none effect? Do we, make, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So when we're saved by grace, we don't do away with the law. We keep the law. Let me illustrate this for you. I had just been preaching outside a large city in America. I had left the, that appointment for another appointment. And I got in my car, and I was driving too fast. The speed limit was maybe, as you see there, 55 or 60. I usually don't drive fast. You can ask my wife. But I was hurrying. And I was hurrying going so fast, maybe 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And pretty soon, I saw a car behind me, and it had a red light on top of it. You see any cars like that in Kenya with red lights? Yeah. So the police stopped me, and he pulled me over. And he said, sir, do you know how fast you were going? I said, too fast? He said, yes, too fast. <laughs> he said, sir, give me your license. And I took out my ministerial license, not my driver's license. And I said, sir, 
can I tell you a story before you arrest me? And give me a fine. He kind of looked at me. I said, I'm a preacher. And Mr. Police Officer, we are on the same team. You tell them, you catch them after they break the law, and I tell them to keep the law. So we're really on the same team. And since we're on the same team, can you give me grace? <laughs> he looked at me, and he said, Pastor, go and keep the law. <laughs> so I got in my car. Now, when I broke the law, what did I deserve? Somebody cried out, death. No, no, not, the, not death penalty for speaking. <laughs> Come on, give me a break, would you? So when I broke the law, I deserved a penalty, right? So did he give me what I deserved? No. So I was not under the law now, but I was under grace, right? So when I was under grace, I got in my car, I started it up, and I was under grace now. I'm not under the law. I hit that speed thing, that, that gas pedal as fast as I could, and I took off there at 89, 100 miles an hour. Because I was not under the law, I was under grace, right? I got behind that wheel, kept looking behind me, drove as slow as I possibly could. Because when I was under grace, I wanted to do what? Keep the law. You see, when we're under grace, we don't want to disobey the law. We want to keep it. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy. I came to fulfill. Did Jesus come to destroy the law that said, thou shalt not steal? Not at all. Did he come to destroy the law that said, thou shalt not commit adultery? Not at all. Did he come to destroy the law that said, remember the Sabbath, that he wrote with his own finger on tables of stone? Not at all. Saved by grace, we keep God's law. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What does it mean when the Bible says we're not under the law? It simply means this. It means to, to be under the law means to be under the law as a method of salvation. So we're not under the law method of salvation. We are under the grace method of salvation. So the law is not the agency that saves us. Grace is. Notice what the Bible says. Romans 6 verse 14, you're not under the law, not under the law method of salvation, but under grace. What does it mean to be under grace? To be under grace means that I accept Christ's pardon, I receive Christ's forgiveness, and I'm filled with Christ's power. That's what it means to be under grace, that I've been pardoned by Christ, forgiven by Christ, filled with the power of Christ. I have come to Jesus, and he's changed my life. You see, the law reveals our need. The law is like a mirror. Let's suppose I'm out working on my car, and I'm out there, and I, I, I'm working in the engine, and I get grease here, and grease on my nose, grease on my face, and my wife calls me, and she says, darling, it's time to come in to eat, and I come in, and she says, do you know that your face is dirty? You got, you got, you got oil on your nose. You got a, and I say, no, I don't. She says, go look in the mirror, and what do I do? I look in the mirror, and I see my wife was right after all. I should have known that from the beginning, right? And so, oil here, oil here, oil here, and I'm looking at the mirror. Now, can the mirror cleanse my face? But can the mirror tell me my face is dirty? So what do I need to cleanse my face? I need some good soap, right? So God's law is like the mirror that tells us our face is dirty, but the law can't cleanse us. Only God's grace can cleanse us. We come to the cross of Calvary. We kneel at the cross of Calvary. We say, Jesus, I've sinned. I've broken your law. Pardon me, Jesus. And he says, my grace is yours. He says, if you confess your sin, I'm faithful and just to forgive your sin. What is the only sin Jesus cannot forgive? It is the sin that we will not confess. Because if we do the confessing, he'll do the forgiving. So what is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is the one that cannot be pardoned because we cling to it, we hold on to it, we don't confess it, and pretty soon our, heart, our minds become so hardened we can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore. So we come to the cross. We say, Jesus, forgive, and his grace forgives us. 
We say, Jesus, empower me. His grace fills our life to empower us. The entire law can be summarized in one word, love. Remember, there were some Pharisees that came to Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, they said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Je they said, teacher, what's the great commandment in the law? In Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. And Jesus said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second great commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, some people think that these passages are simply New Testament passages. But you remember Jesus said after the Ten Commandments were given in Deuteronomy, Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments where he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. In Leviticus 19.18, he, uh, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. See, all Jesus was doing was expanding what it means to love. What does it mean to love? It means to love God supremely. That's the first four commandments. And it means to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the last six commandments. So the whole Ten Commandment law can be summarized in one word, love. But then if you break it down, it's love God and love your fellow man. How do I love God? By obeying him and keeping the first four commandments. How do I love my fellow man? By keeping the last six commandments. So what Jesus said is this. On these two commandments, love God and love your fellow man, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, the entire Ten Commandment law is based on love. Loving God and loving your fellow man. Let's look at those commandments a little more deeply tonight. Are those commandments relevant in the world that we live in? Do these commandments apply to Africa tonight? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In a society where some have made money and cars and houses gods, the Ten Commandment law still speaks, you shall have no other gods before me. In some areas where sports have become the god, in some areas where the gods have become entertainment and video games, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. In a society where some still in village areas make graven images, God says, you shall not make any graven image because the graven image is made by man's hands. And God says, I'm your great creator. You shall not have any other graven image. At a time when the name of Jesus is taken in vain, at a time when that lovely name of Jesus, that name at which angels bow, that name that is so sacred, that many still take in vain. Jesus says, thou shalt not take the name of your, thy God in vain. At a time when men and women have forgotten the Bible Sabbath, written with God's finger on tables of stone, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Echoing down through the centuries, God says, find rest on the Sabbath. Find rest from your labors. Find rest from your stress and worry. Come every Sabbath and worship the living God. Find fellowship with your brothers and sisters in the church. Find fellowship with your family on Sabbath not a day for buying and selling, in a day when many children turn their backs on the commands of their parents, there is still a command that says, honor your father and mother. At a day when bombs drop, when murders occur, at a day of war, bloodshed, conflict, and strife, God still says, thou shall not kill. At a time when many live together not being married, at a time of confusion of the sexes, at a time of immorality, at a time when men at times leave their wives and wives leave their husbands for somebody else, the commandment still says, it is still relevant, thou shalt not commit adultery. At a time of thievery and robbery and dishonesty, God calls us to honesty and says, thou shalt not steal. 
at a time when many people are filled with criticism and gossip and ruin people by defaming their name and ruin their reputation, God says, thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And at a time when many people are coveting, they want what others have, God says, thou shall not covet. The Ten Commandment Law is still relevant today. The Ten Commandment Law is heaven's eternal code of conduct. The Ten Commandment Law speaks to the world today. It speaks to Africa tonight. Tonight, if men and women truly were saved by grace, if men and women were truly obedient to God, would the world have the problems it does tonight? Would Africa have its problems? Would Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Etolia, would, 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 would Sudan, would, would, would these countries have the problems they have if we accepted God's law as the foundation of all of our lives, the foundation of all of society? I propose to you tonight that God's heaven standard of conduct is not to restrict our happiness, but it is for our happiness, the happiness of our families, the happiness of our societies. Because the Bible says, Psalm 111, verse 7 and onward, the works of God's hands are verity and judge justice. All his precepts, that's all his commandments, are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. He has commanded his covenant for how long? How long? All of his precepts are forever. His covenant between his people is forever. Satan lost heaven because of disobedience. Adam and Eve lost Eden because of disobedience. Jesus is leading men and women today, saved by grace, not to do away with his law, but to live godly, obedient lives. Look at what it says in Hebrews 8, verse 10. It says, I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be, to be my people. What does it mean that God's going to write his law in our mind? What does it mean he's going to write his law in our heart? He writes his law in our mind so we know what to do. He writes his law in our heart so we love to be obedient to God. See, obedience for the person saved by grace is not some legalistic requirement. Obedience for the person saved by grace comes from a heart of love. When you really love, if you love your wife, you want to please her. If you love your husband, you want to please him. Children who love their parents want to please them. And when we have this deep love for God, all we want to do is please him. He writes his law in our minds so we know it. He writes his law in our heart so we love it. And God is going to have a last day people who have the law written in their hearts and who have the law written in their minds. They know what God wants them to do and they love to do it because they know that the law of God is the law of liberty. They know that the law of God, bring, obedience to it, brings greatest happiness. And they know that they will one day stand before God in the judgment and be accountable for the choices they make. And they take responsibility for those choices. And saved by grace, transformed by God's love, charmed by the cross, they live godly, obedient lives. The Bible says about God's end-time people, Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience or the endurance of the saints, the believers. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you long to be part of God's end-time people? When Jesus comes again, do you long to be caught up in the sky and meet him in glory? If you die before his coming, do you long to hear the voice of Jesus saying, John, come forth, Mary, come forth, Peter, come forth, Miriam or Alice, come forth. Do you long to, to see Jesus when he comes? Do you long to have that glorious, immortal body when he comes? 
Do you long to be changed into his likeness when he comes? Do you long to ascend into heaven? If you've died before he comes, to be resurrected. If you're living when he comes, to be caught up in glory. Is that your desire tonight? Do, do you long for that? He says, his end time people will have a heart filled with the faith of Jesus. They will live godly, obedient lives. They will walk into the heavenly city. Listen, here's how Revelation ends. Revelation 22, verse 14. This is the conclusion of Revelation. This is the final chapter of Revelation. These are the final verses of Revelation. Blessed. What's blessed mean? Happy, joyful. Blessed are those that do what? That do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and enter through the gates into the city. How many of you tonight, by raising your hand, want to say, Pastor, I want to enter in through the gates of the city. Blessed are those that do his commandments. Blessed are those that enter in through the gates of the city, that they may enter in by his grace, through his power. We can live obedient lives. However weak you feel, he is strong. However powerless you feel, he has power. However feeble you feel, he will enable you to be an overcomer. One time, in the city of Chicago, Dwight L. Moody, that very famous preacher, was preaching. Thousands were coming to his meetings. And after the meetings, many people would gather around him. And finally, there was a woman that brought her son to meet this famous preacher, Dwight Moody. And as the boy came, she said to her son, you'll never have a chance again in your life. This man is one of the most famous preachers in the world. Son, shake his hand. Dwight Moody reached out his hand to shake the boy's hand. The boy went like this. He took his hands, he put them behind his back. The mother was very embarrassed. Son, shake Pastor Moody's hand. The boy, son, take your hands from behind your back. The boy took his hand like this, a fist. The woman was so embarrassed. She said, son, open your fingers. No, mama. Son, open your fingers. No, mama. She took her hand and began to, to open the boy's fingers. And when the boy opened his hand, he had marbles in his hand. <laughs> that was one of his favorite little things. It's all he had. And he thought the evangelist was going to take his marbles from him, <laughs> take these little, beautiful, round stones that he played with. He didn't want to give them up. Jesus is reaching out his hand to you tonight. Imagine Jesus sitting next to you tonight. And he's saying, open your hand. Is there something you are clinging to? Something you're holding on to? Something you haven't surrendered? Tonight, would you like to say, Jesus, I want to open my hand. I want to open my heart. I want to open my mind. Lord, I want to be all of yours. I don't want to hold anything back. Is that your desire tonight? Would you stand wherever you are? If you want to say, Jesus, I want to open my hand. Jesus, I want to open my heart. Jesus, I just give it all to you tonight. Because one day we will stand before the judgment bar of God. There's somebody thinking, yes, Lord, I want, I want to give it all, but I feel weak. I feel weak. I'm going to invite you to come tonight. You've stood making a decision, wherever you are, to give it all to Jesus. But you're going to need strength. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to come. Forget about this audience. Just stand here with head bowed and say to Jesus, Pray when you come to the altar. Pray and say, Jesus, I've given it all. I'm yours, but I need your strength. I'm inviting three groups to come tonight. Wherever you are watching, I want you to come. Wherever you are watching, 
you come to that screen. You come to that screen. If you're watching in your home, you can kneel there tonight. You can join in this prayer. If you're listening on the radio, pull your car to the side of the road and make this commitment. And when you're coming, you're saying, God, I'm giving it all. I'm giving it all. But I need strength. I need power, Lord. Three groups. First, somebody who's giving it all, but you need the power of God. You're going to come to this altar. This is the place of prayer. This is the place of blessing. This is the place where the Holy Spirit is poured out. Secondly, if you're preparing for baptism, you've been in the baptismal class, you're going to come, and I'm going to pray over you tonight. Thirdly, if you've drifted away and you want to come back, you're going to come tonight. Just begin to come now. I'll greet you. Come, my brother, and share in Swahili. Wherever you are tonight, you just come. You need strength. You need power. You need the blessings of God. You just come, and I'll pray over you. Unaweza ukaja 